Jerry Frank, and I um, was the milliner and craftsperson with Pacific Northwest Ballet. Worked there for about 12 years. In a way, I stumbled upon the job. I had been, um, I've been dealing with theater since high school. Um, I have a little bit of education, but I don't have a degree. Um, I've been building costumes since junior high school, um, first for myself, and then I uh, joined some a puppet troupe, a mask troupe that performed, and I built costumes for them and myself who performed in that. I've done costumes for um, local dance companies, um, all the while um, holding down other jobs that paid the bills. Um, I had two other major careers in my life, one with the telephone company and then one with a arts manufacturing company. And once I left the, the last one, um, I decided I wanted to do something that allowed me to be the artist instead of being the person that supported other artists. Um, and my friend Wendy, who is the dyer at the ballet, uh, needed some help on a project and she asked me to come in and help her. I did that and got along really well with the group, and they just kept bringing me back as overhire. Um, all the while, uh, I was sort of being mentored in that position by um, Jen Stone, who was the milliner at that time. Um, but I brought a lot of my own skills with me to that, um, that I had developed on my own, and also um, other people that I had met along my way had mentored me. Um, and eventually, uh, Jen left the position and they hired me full time into that uh, role as the milliner and craftsperson. That's how I got there. Quite varied, particularly the role that I had. I had a, it's a very diverse amount of um, projects that I would get. Um, I built uh, leather boots. Uh, that would be stitched on to the men's shoes. That was one of the first projects that I did um, and then continued to do that while I was there. I painted the pint shoes and the shoes that the men wear, um, whatever color or flesh tones. Um, I did that a lot. Um, let's see, I built a lot of tiaras and headpieces, which was the part that I liked a lot. That was fun. Um, hats. Uh, not a lot of really crazy big hats, but I did build some hats in the time that I was there. Um, and then I did a lot of uh, large projects. I used to have a studio at my home um, that was a large studio, and that allowed me to build large pieces. Um, I built horses. I reworked the horses for the Nutcracker with Wendy Oberlin, and that was really fun. Um, and then rolling dresses for another ballet that the women would stand behind and roll around the stage. That was really great, did that at my studio. And then I had the pleasure of working with Kelly and Jen making um, Mother Ginger for uh, the new Nutcracker for the ballet, which is really great. So there was, those are some of the variety of things that I did, making masks, collars, you know, buttons, just jewelry, all a variety of things. Um, at the ballet, um, it was a, it's a small shop, um, so it's tight quarters, uh, but I worked on a table that was about eight by four um, feet, and it was covered with, I believe it's covered with cork, and then a layer of paper, and then another layer of uh, a plastic laminate on top of that, and what that allowed me to do was to pin into the table. A lot of the work that I did, I could, uh, utilize bending wire around pens and having a table that I could pin into was really helpful. And also because it was covered in plastic, I could paint on it and it was easy to clean up. So the table was really important. At my home studio, I also had a large table like that, that I had a, a large cutting mat on um, that I could also pin into a little bit, but more than that, I was able to use a roller cutter on um, and cut large pieces of cloth really quickly. So those were a couple of the tools that were important. Um, lots of pliers, lots of different kinds of scissors, um, different kinds of elements to pen with. Um, 
let's see, a hot knife uh, that I used to cut um, materials that were plastic in some nature, and that allows you to seal the edges of those. Um, that uh, is used on a glass surface, and so I had pieces of glass, or actually at the ballet, I'd hold another table set up uh, back in a spray booth area where I could do hot cutting. Um, I also had the spray booth, which is a booth that's designed to pull the toxic fumes away as you're spraying paint or working with um, acetone or other kinds of nasty chemicals that help to bring the air out. And so that was a critical tool. Um, sewing machines, uh, glues, wires. Uh, let's see what other tools on um, my hands you do a lot of hand work those are the most important and those I carried with me <laughs> it depends on the the task or the ballet that you're building for but usually I would create a binder and in the binder I would have Xerox copies of the uh, designs that I'd been given if I'd been given designs and I would organize that binder in a way that allowed me to make notes on each project, particularly when we were building um, full length ballets where there would be multiple projects that I was working on at one time or, or at least in charge of um, seeing those through. And that way I could make notes um, along with the drawings. I would also keep patterns in that book. Um, often I would um, put scheduling in there um, things to remind me of uh, due dates that I had or notes on the people that I was going to be working with, collaborating with, um, tasks that I would try to schedule for them. Um, and that was the main way. Um, also my space, I would change my space depending on the project I was working on so that I could store um, often the work that I did. There were multiples of the same thing that I was making. And so I would have create spaces where I could line those out so that I could be looking at them and follow the um, different levels of completion and also have them visually um, in my eye space so that both my team and I could watch that progression and keep track of where we needed to go. Um, also, I found plastic bins helpful to collect different pieces of projects to organize them. Um, yeah. Yeah, there's a quite a spectrum of um, working with designers, what they will bring to the table. Even within a project, the same designer may have very specific ideas about some of the projects and then not really know what they want to do with the others. And in those cases, there's more of a collaboration um, and you bring I more ideas to the table in those cases. And it's still a collaboration, but it, it's a sliding scale of what you do. Um, and then other times um, you're the designer. Um, it's something that's being done in house and you're just being asked to create something. Um, and those you're still collaborating to a certain degree with the choreographer and other people that are working in the shop. If your project um, works into some element of the costume along with theirs. Um, yeah. A lot of the work that we do in the ballet is um, those roles aren't as strictly defined and you find yourself moving back and forth um, into those different roles and filling in where the need is, um, is great. So I did a lot of stitching um, as well. Um, I did a lot of cutting. Um, and so when I was working on a project, like an example would be when we built the Jewels Ballet. Um, I worked with the drapers and the stitchers on the jeweling that would be done on the front of the bodices. And so I um, took some initial patterns that the draper had done and then did layouts of what the jewels would be. Um, and then we would work with the designer to tweak that, um, changing the colors or changing the placement of the jewels. And then I would document all of that with both photographs and also um, drawings that then would be used um, to put all of those together. We would make you know, 18 pieces of the same bodice and all the jewels 
in theory needed to be placed in the same way, there was a roadmap that we could use um, to do that. So that's one of the ways. Um, sometimes when you're building belts, for an example, with marks of pwn a lot of the time, you know, there would be elements of that that I would be putting with the belt, but often he would hand off the rest of the belt construction to me. So, you know, there would be stitching and cutting involved there. Those are a couple examples. Um, I mean, the main thing is that the costume or whatever accessory it is that you're working on for them has to be worn um, on stage while they're moving. And it needs to not inhibit their movement um, at, in general. I mean, sometimes a choreographer or a designer will build something that the dancer has to conform to. Um, like Mother Ginger, for example, um, there's not as much freedom in that. But generally, you have to build um, with their movement um, and think about that a lot in terms of how you build it. Also, with ballet, the costumes get used over and over. Um, theater, sometimes you'll see a piece once and it goes away and the costume is done when it's been used. In ballet, um, that piece will come back over and over again throughout the years, or even if it, within one year, for example, the Nutcracker costumes, they can be used in 38 performances in a year. And that happens, you know, every year. So that means that those costumes have to be built to hold up to that kind of um, use. Um, and they have to be built in a way that they can be repaired or altered. Um, many times and so those considerations and then individual dancers will tell you you know their particular needs and you do your best to try to um, meet those needs uh, it's not always possible um, but you want to make them happy as well that, that was one of probably one of the largest projects that I worked on um, Mother Ginger is um, part of the uh, act two, and um, it's the entertainment part. So the, the kids who are, have come to this uh, Candyland area um, are being entertained by all these different people. And Mother Ginger is one of the acts. And Mother Ginger has eight children, and they all are underneath her skirt. So it's played by a man who's on stilts, who wears a giant skirt, and inside the skirt are eight children. So the man has to be able to walk out with the kids under the skirt, onto the stage. The kids come in and out of the skirt. There's a curtain at the very front that Mother Ginger pulls a cord and lifts the curtain. The children come out. Um, and um, ideally, you don't want to know that the children are under there when he comes out. It's a, a bit of a surprise. So you don't want to see their little feet. So you have to figure out how to hide all of that give them space to stand and move within the skirt without stepping on each other or being stepped on by the guy in stilts. Um, uh, they do a dance and he spins around in the skirt. So he has to be able to also dance himself to a certain degree. So balancing has to be really good. It can't be off balance. It's gonna cause problems. And um, anyway, and also for the safety of the kids and him, the skirt has to function really well. Um, and it's a highlight of the show, so it really was a fun project to do, and I think quite successful. Uh, it was a great project to work on for multiple reasons. One, the designer, Ian Falconer, who I adore, um, uh, is really fun, and collaborating with him is, um, um, is a joy. He's um, pretty easy to work with. He also knows what he wants when he sees it. Um, and if he doesn't know what he wants, he's open to all kinds of suggestions. Um, not much uh, attitude there, which is great. So from that standpoint, it was a really great project. Also, I got, it was a large project that I did in my studio. Um, and along with that, I had, um, well, mainly two collaborators that I collaborated with you, Kelly and Jen Stone, who both are extraordinarily talented people and so it was really fun in that way to work with um, colleagues that um, knew what they were doing and could bring a lot to the table because um, it was a huge daunting task and 
we needed all of us to try to figure it out. Um, in addition to that, we also worked with um, uh, John Hackett, who is part of the production staff, and he built the metal frame for Mother Ginger that the whole thing is built off of. So there was collaboration with him. Uh, his was the first part that needed to happen. And um, everything else came after that was completed. So there was a lot of work sizing it appropriately so that it would fit around multiple waists, um, so that the weight wouldn't be too much. And so that skirt uh, carries a lot of weight. So we were always really being conscious of the weight. So first was the frame trying to make it as light as possible. And um, we also had to get the performer in and out of the skirt. Um, and we chose to take a different avenue than what New York had done, which was where the original designs had been worked. And we chose to not have to lift the skirt over the top of the dancer's head, um, but we chose to have a skirt that would open up and the dancer could walk into. So. All of that was done by John Hackett. Thank God I didn't have to figure that out. He, he's brilliant and he's, we've done two other projects um, with aluminum framing. Um, so I knew that he was capable of doing it and we also collaborate really well. So that was the first part. And then the rest was figuring out how to take the image that Ian had given us and make it come to life. And the drawing, um, the scale of the drawing was different than what we actually ended up creating. So that meant that we had um, some leeway or an additional challenge to figure out what that was going to look like. Um, and then we had to dress it, which was our main task, was how do we make those lines that he's drawn in the top actually work? Um, what fabrics do you use? Um, how do you lay that on top of a frame and not have the frame show? Um, then the, the part that hangs down, how does that function so that the children who are underneath that skirt are not seen, but um, also it's as light as possible. You also wanted to have a lot of dimension to it, um, so we had to figure out ways to bring that to life. And then just all of the decoration that went on top of that um, we built a lot of the flowers ourselves rather than buying them. I mean, there are both on there. There are cat balls that are in there, lots of ribbon, um, and just putting that together in a way that um, brought it to life and that it would function. It was a great project. It was another a huge project, but in a different way, huge in the fact that there were so many pieces that we were building. And they were very complicated and very um, uh, laborious, lots of handwork. Um, I think we both probably wrecked our hands a lot during that process, but it was worth it. It was very um, uh, satisfying. Um, the designer that we worked with, um, Jerome Kaplan, uh, who's from France, Paris, we've worked with a couple of times now. Um, uh, who's really quite brilliant and also very good at um, making his, he knows what he wants and can communicate it clearly. So that made that a good project. Um, initially, it started with um, very specific drawings that he created, which is a bit unusual for him. Um, it's because the type of the project that it was that he took more time with detail in the drawings. So what that did was it gave me a lot of information about what I was trying to create. Um, and then the task was trying to figure out how the heck we were going to do that, because they were very complicated, um, beautiful designs. Um, so I started with paper, um, and you start building mock-ups with paper and a little bit of wire that you can place on a head. Um, and that is to look at scale, and you have conversations with the designer about um, scale and then you start making little tiny pieces of um, mock-ups of materials to discuss with uh, the designer again what fabrics he might want to use, what kind of cording he might want to use, what sorts of jewels um, or sequins, those kinds of things. And um, once you get a good idea then you build another mock-up which is a little closer to what the end product is going to be to refine all of that. Um, and the way that we built most of those was with millinery wire as the base. 
um, and Buckram. And then we uh, used a product, Wonder Under, that allows you to adhere material to the uh, Buckram. So we ironed on um, gold and silver fabrics onto these pieces and then um, stitched wire onto them. And actually, the wire is covered with a um, cording. So cording usually comes with a, um, a center to it that's usually some sort of a cotton or polyester fiber. And you um, pull that out of the center and then feed that onto the wire. And that gives it more of a finished jewelry look. Um, you bend that wire and then you stitch it onto the buckram and hide all of the stitching underneath the uh, cording, uh, but you're catching the wire that's inside. Um, and that allows it to be really lightweight, but very sturdy. And then you start decorating. And in jewels, we decorate it with a lot of rhinestones. So it's very delicate and laborious work, but in the end, it does look like metal, um, but it's a much lighter project product than metal would be. And then there was one design that um, kept changing. And in that case, instead of buckram, we used a product that's called Kren. It's a nylon mesh um, that's pretty sturdy. There are different weights of it. And I use it a lot in building tiaras because it's lightweight. And again, I use the um, hot knife tool that we talked about earlier um, to seal the edges of that. Um, and then that gets stitched on. And that creates an airy backdrop um, that you can dye um, different colors, and then you can stitch the uh, other products, the jewels, onto that, and it makes it very airy and light, uh, both looking and also in terms of weight for the dancer. A lot of the tiaras that people are familiar with are used in beauty pageants or, you know, they're from royal families around, and those are lovely, and those are all made by jewelers, but they're very heavy. Um, and that means that you know they're worn an evening, and those usually aren't for long periods of time where dancer has to be able to wear that tiara, and they um, use their head a lot um, in spotting, and they have to be able to do that because otherwise it will inhibit their their movement. So the tiaras have to be be able to be anchored onto the head really well so that it doesn't move around, so the dancer doesn't have to think about it or be bothered by it. It has to be really white light so that it doesn't give them a headache or also create a problem with their movement. So thus wire. The, there were probably close to 100 tiaras in all. Um, we make usually, um, we make the number of tiaras that are required on stage with a few extras. Um, in case anything happens, then you've got a backup. Um, and then everyone that wore a tiara had a bias. So both the front and the back of those bodices had jewels on them on some sort of a net or mesh. Um, so that's another 100 pieces at least. Um, and then a lot of the skirts um, on the, the women also had jewels on them and we jeweled a lot of that as well. So that's jeweling on top of um, nylon tulle. Um, and that's a whole nother ball game. That was done a lot with the hot fix jewels. Um, so a lot, a lot of pieces. <laughs> a lot of the jewels on the larger jewels on the bodices for that were stitched on and then secured again with glue on the back side where the knots were, um, sort of as an insurance policy. Um, we also, both on the tiaras and on those fronts, we use what are called hot fix jewels that come with a glue that's on the back of the jewel that's heat sensitive. You heat the jewel, melts the glue on the back, and then you press it onto whatever the project it is. Um, but there were also um, jewels that did not, we couldn't get with hot fix um, that we use different kinds of glues. Um, E6000 is one that's very um, popular. Um, and uh, then we used, um, I think Jewelet is another jewel that is a preferred one. And there are syringes that you can buy um, that allow you to uh, work with the glue in a really controlled fashion. Um, so we use that. Um, we also have um, 
materials that you can do the gluing over the top of. Um, it's a, what we use a lot is it's a, it's a mat that's created for cooking that's sort of a non-stick. And you can put that down underneath your project so that your glue can come through that, but then you can clean the glue off of it and it doesn't stick to it. Um, we built stretcher bars um, that the fabrics that would be covering the bodices that had the jewels on them were stretched over so that it allowed us to do the stitching through and control the fabric in a way um, that made it faster because we did a lot of them. There were flower head pieces and those are from Giselle. Um, again, that was a Jerome Kaplan. Each girl had um, her own look. Um, she had a beautiful bodice out of this embroidered um, fabric. And what Jerome wanted was the um, flower head pieces to all have the same shape, but to speak to the fabrics that were in the bodice. And so we spent a lot of time arranging silk flowers and velvet leaves um, to mimic or at least speak to the, um, the bodices. It was a mask uh, for a cricket. We used a um, fencing mask that we bought online as the base. And that's another thing that you do a lot is you look for creative ways to um, keep your budget down and, um, you know, try to come up with a a fast way to bring a project to a resolution. And so you look for options where you'd have to build it. It actually ended up getting canceled. We got close to having a final design, but it was a fun project. Here's a, um, this is a piece that I made before I got, the, was working with the ballet. It's a headpiece for a goddess. And um, again, just silk flowers and beads. These are um, on a, piano wire or spring wire that gives it its sort of liveliness. Um, that's a wire that I wouldn't recommend using unless you have a really specific need from it because it's hard to work with. And also um, once it bends, it sort of stays bent. Um, but in certain in instances, it's really fun to work with. So there's the back, it comes with a veil. And it's um, again built with wire. There's a comb here to help keep it on. So another thing you have to think about is how it's going to stay on. Usually in tiaras that's done with horse hair that's sewn onto it that the um, women or the men can pin bobby pin into to keep it on. Here's another headpiece that I did that um, is again with millinery wire as the base and then this is just a fun piece of lace trim that I think I took off of a dress um, but the shape of it really said that it would work as a tiara. And then this is wire that has jewels glued onto it. And then more hot fixed jewels on top of that. Um, just a really creative way to play with things. And in this case, I used a, I don't know if you can see this, is kind of a funky form, but down here there's more lace. So it's a complete circle. And that actually sits behind the head and helps hold it on. Something clever, probably wouldn't work for a dancer, but this wasn't for a dancer, so who cares? <laughs> Uh, this is another headpiece that I've changed a little bit. It was a mock-up that we did for a ballet called The Seasons. And there was um, winter, which was all these snowflakes. And the snowflakes were black and silver. Um, so I made this unusual headpiece. And it's made, here's some pieces. The, this is wire. And then it, it's got a plastic that has an iridescence to it. Um, that when it catches the light. Um, and that's what makes up the piece that's on this. Um, there's also these, which is the um, crayon that I was talking about, it's black. And then there is foil on it, uh, silver foil that's been glued down um, that's sort of evocative of a snowflake. And that's part of that. And that just all got wired in. Um, and then I added some color to it for another project that I did later with a little hot pink tieettes in it. But that's really lightweight. And again, it's thinking out of the box, finding materials that is not really meant to be used. This was materials that was made um, to be used in kites. Uh, so that's where that came from. Um, here's cording uh, that I was talking about. 
Um, uh, and it comes in, you know, different weights and different colors, it even comes in black and different colors. And that's what uh, you use to put over the wire. Um, there's also tubular horsehair, um, and this comes in different sizes, but that can also be put over the wire um, to give it a very different look. So, you know, always keep your eye out for strange products that you might be able to use. You never know where that's um, going to take you. Cat balls, really important. <laughs> One, I think, the, is to really look at whether you have a passion for the work that you're going to do. Um, it's not a career that's likely to um, bring you a lot of money. I mean, there are people that may get to that level, but it's, um, it's unlikely. So I think it's important to um, look at the passion that you have for it and the satisfaction that you get out of building the pieces and doing that work. And if that really is going to satisfy you, then I say, um, you know, go for it. Um, even if you're not sure, try it and see, you, you know, it, you'll figure it out. Um, uh, and then be willing to, um, you know, really get into a situation where you are mentored by other people that have done that work. Um, you can only do so much training um, because you never know what the project is going to be and what kinds of problem solving it is that you need to do. Um, and budgets are often a big part of that, so you have to be really creative. So, you know, look for unusual materials to use, and that you can play with at home and just start developing your skills. But I would say connect with people that are doing making art and learn as much as you can about the different kinds of media that are out there and then play with it and find your own way um, to bring it to a place that someone maybe hasn't and um, let that be the satisfaction that you get.